Welcome to Unmute with PRCAI, a podcast series that hosts conversations with change makers and business leaders to craft the narrative of a bold and assertive India. This series is powered by AdFactors PR, and I'm Niret Alva. Our guest today is one of the most influential women in Indian business. Armed with an MBA from Harvard and a Padma Shri awardee, she has had a stellar career as a banker and shuffles many different roles, including chairperson of Rothschild. Nena Lal Kidvai, welcome to Unmute. Looking back on your rather checkered career over so many years, can you share with us your perspective on how you've seen corporate India evolve? What would you say are the major changes? This is a huge question because my career as uh, you know, spans 35 years of what are probably the most uh, tumultuous and uh, indeed so full of change for India, where we went from being a very socialist economy to a much more capitalist one. Uh, The most exciting periods were, of course, the opening up of India in 91, so full of despair as we were, uh, where, you know, we looked near bankruptcy and we were selling our gold to the opening up of India, uh, right to the point where we are today, where we are almost seen as the saviors of the world. So these ups and downs, I've learned are sometimes so pivotal to understand at each stage that we provide the corrections as we go. And looking at the financial sector, uh, we went from a period where we had just volumes of share certificates, systems and processes which were so paper intensive that you had scams like the Harshad Mehta one or just volumes of share certificates which were getting duplicated because we had not moved with the times in terms of digitizing all this. And imagine these huge steps that we have had to take. And I have been part of that process and so excited to be part of that process that I've never once regretted having come back to India, having had the option of uh, staying in the US after my MBA degree. And the question I used to get asked a lot, why are you back here? And I always thought that the right reason would be because I could be part of a change. I could be a big fish in a smaller pond. I could drive some of the change or that the global world was seeing in our country. And I think every part of that desire was so fulfilling in my career uh, because I had the chance to work uh, not just at my day job, but to be part of some of these very important journeys, uh, which including the dematting of shares, it included getting a second stock exchange, the National Stock Exchange set up, because we could not get the Bombay Stock Exchange to change and move with the times. And lo and behold, the NSC overtook the BSC and the BSC finally had to follow suit and uh, do what we were suggesting and requiring in terms of moving with the age. So some of these negotiations, discussions, learning from those that were already in the trade, in the businesses, was a very fascinating part of where India has come. And if you look at where we are today, with uh, the digital stack with the countries built, 40% of global transactions happen in India, in the digital space, that we have moved so hugely into the new world Uh, for every person who uses a digital solution to pay through Google Pay, through Paytm, etc. And all possible because the country has built that infrastructure, the national payment system, which enables this. And likewise with, you know, of course, the uh, Aadhaar cards, which are are helping with the whole KYC process and uh, the banking system, which uh, is enabling direct to bank remit, you know, subsidies and payments by government uh, to those that should be receiving the subsidies rather than the old food subsidy systems. So the changes are so vast, you have to tell me what you want to focus on, but I am hugely excited by where we are at this point of time and our journey. Okay, building a little bit on your answer, the digital revolution, can you go a little deeper into that and Tell us what that really, truly signifies and uh, what the next steps in the evolution of that you see happening over the next coming years. Yeah. 
You know, this is a great question and actually a huge area for us in India. I'm just back from the women empowerment, uh, uh, the G20 uh, discussions, uh, the ministerial that happened in Gandhinagar and uh, digital skilling uh, from for the perspective of women is a key part of that agenda. And it's a key part of that agenda because across the world, and it of course gets compounded in a developing nations such as ours, but across the world, uh, boys are more likely to access uh, a smartphone, to have more access to the internet, particularly in uh, low income groups than the girl child is. Uh, and that factor is 1.8. So the boy has twice, almost twice the likelihood of having access vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the girl. So access to technology is clearly key. We can build the best internet systems in the world, but if we can't give access to every one of our citizens, that is an issue and every one to our women, uh, how do they progress? So the whole digital divide is one that I fear could become worse for us in country, in terms of those that need it most and women getting left behind because this issue of access. Then there's the issue of skilling and training. Now, the good news with digital is you can be illiterate and still use a computer. I've seen this with my own eyes. I mean, right through COVID, uh, Seva, who my husband and I have worked with for years, uh, were enable their women to see the picture of the garment and the embroidery required on the screen uh, to copy it. Uh, were able to then send it, uh, as in send the pictures out uh, by using uh, the digital process and receive payment through digital payments. So the transaction getting completed in a way which was taught to them, they were enabled, but they essentially are not highly educated women, but very intelligent women who are able to learn and then use these devices. And imagine what we can do with digital when we move to voice, as we, we, you know, a lot of the apps are enabling in any case, where you don't have to be literate. It can be visual, it can be voice, and you're able to then interact in a way that the internet provides you. So that's the opportunity. But we have to make sure that it is available to everyone across the board. In fact, uh, uh, at this uh, same event, India in its G20 space has uh, announced a tech equity platform, which is for women digital training at all levels. So you can enter it at whichever level you want. This was developed by Intel in collaboration with FIKI and the ministry. And uh, this is our contribution to the world, tech equity. And what we need is more of this for men, women, the training that on the one hand enables us to access the many programs government has, but the people who need it most don't quite know how to access it on the one hand. And on the other, to be able to empower ourselves with livelihoods and ways to reach our products to the markets uh, that are possible. Uh, I saw this in a very simple way as way back as 2006, when uh, while at a CEO of HSBC, we were supporting a microfinance uh, company uh, led by uh, a wonderful lady, Chetna Gala. And uh, her initiative was to set up what she called a management school, which is what we were helping her with where simple women were being taught how to basically make money in their businesses. And their business was how to use a mobile phone to collect prices of vegetables from surrounding mandis. So she priced her vegetables for the day. She stitched petticoats. She then learned to have 25 women work for her to be able to deliver petticoats to the villages around. So very simple tools that enabled, again, these really illiterate women in very poor neighborhoods, in this case, uh, uh, in Maharashtra, in the really the outer regions of Maharashtra, and brought them into market practice in a way that they were able to have the economic empowerment to take their families forward. And I think at the core of some of this is the microfinance movement in the country, which is really going great guns at the moment and uh, I think is really a very interesting space for our progress. The self-help groups that come with it, the fact that women are combining in these small groups of eight to 10, standing guarantee for each other in loans, 
And while the first loans are typically taken for reasons of someone sick or school fees or weddings or any one of these sort of reasons, the next phase of the loans tends to be to run a little business. And if we can show them how. And by showing them how, the microfinance institution benefits because she's more likely to repay the money on the one hand. On the other, she's now empowered for life. And there are many organizations that are helping women along the way in this livelihood and economic empowerment as we move ahead. So I, I think we are really on a very interesting journey in microfinance and the self-help movement in the country and being supported by government too now. Thank you for not only providing a sort of vision for the digital road ahead, but also showing how that can all come together, the many pieces. Uh, you've been a corporate leader for a large part of your career, and you've reflected across different fora on what leadership is and how challenging it can be for women to lead. What does leadership mean to you and how have you practiced it? And uh, what specific challenges do you think women face as corporate leaders in India? So, look, to me, leadership, I think in yesterday's context, as much but it's as relevant today, is the ability to influence right action. Uh, so it's uh, about being able to ensure that an organization that, that you run, that everyone's on the same page and being able to move forward. And you do that uh, not by directing people, because that doesn't work, but by influencing them into that right action. It's about assembling the right people around you, which doesn't mean that, we, that everyone wears gray suits or you know, has an Anglo-Saxon background, but rather that it has the diversity so that the ideas that come, come from all quarters in terms of people looking at problems in different ways and you're much likely to solve them as a result, which includes therefore women, it's you know, people from different parts of the country in our case, maybe different parts of the world, and as a result, you get this huge sort of ideation. So the ability of leaders today to build teams. So influencing right action, building teams, and I think being able to, to pivot and change. We are in such a fast changing world that you cannot set on one direction and then just stay in that direction. And that direction may not be wrong, but it may not be the right one to stay on beyond three years. So you're always looking, you know, make sure left, right, that if, what is that train that's coming at you that you might miss? How do you change the way you work? And it's a little like what COVID did to a lot of businesses. It made people who thought they might die rethink their model and suddenly it opened up a whole new avenue, the ability to sell on the net, the ability to cater to a marketplace digitally, when, whereas their system had been physical in the past and women who were supplying bread to hotels suddenly found they had a retail market which they never thought they could reach because they didn't know how to it appeared more expensive than in fact it turned out to be and now they've stayed the course with that so i think these are the changes which are sometimes very very important for us to identify well in advance sometimes circumstance helps us as covid uh, did and sometimes you just have to see it for what it is. Otherwise, you become the Xerox that dies because nobody wants Xerox machines. You are the Kodak company that dies because you haven't changed. You're the Nokia who was, I mean, we all had Nokia phones. And hey, who has one now? So that change is so important to identify early enough. And the pace of it uh, is what leadership has to ensure comes uh, through that. And I would add a fourth, which is integrating with communities and society, understanding your, our stakeholders. And it helps on two fronts. Uh, one is, and it's always been, your employees are far more engaged with you as a company if they believe you do the right thing. There's pride in what you represent. I found our engagement scores at HSBC when we were there were sky high. And when you ask them why, it was because they loved what we did when CSR was not mandatory, but what we did with the funds that we provided into the communities. And also that we enabled our employees to participate in that program. So they were aware of it. You know, we had climate champions, we had 
of people who were going out into the fields, fulfilling their own personal desires. And we were being able to guide them into projects which we were working on or helping them with projects that they wanted to work on. So that community engagement brings with it engagement, which is you know self-helping uh, uh, for the company because the employee gets more engaged with the company. And as we go forward now, in fact, it is being required of companies that we be water efficient, energy efficiency, the buildings we occupy being leads rated, etc. So this whole area of community engagement, responsibility, environment sensitivity is uh, being thrust on us. And I'm really delighted that it is. And it is for leadership to recognize it and drive it. So ESG gets discussed a lot in corporate boardrooms today. And I'm really glad to see that as someone who was pushing at this 15 years ago and getting a lot of arched eyebrows. It's great to see that it is now people asking, hey, what can we do rather than why should we do it? You, um, on the little bit of the work that you've done, what you've spoken about, you've expressed, you know, some of the challenges that women go through as leaders. Can you tell yeah. us a little bit about that? So, you know, I, I don't want to start with what we were 35 years ago because it's, uh, it's a very different story. Because I work in the sanitation area, you know, I call it the toilet index. I mean, when I started my career, women did not join marketing organizations because uh, they couldn't go out into this, you know, in selling in markets because there were no loos. Women who joined the police force, uh, even today, can have an issue in terms of just finding a place uh, the good news is that the toilet agenda in the country is one where we at least move to 100% access. But my toilet index at office was the organizations I joined, I had to walk up three floors to access the one loo, which was available to us as women in the whole building, a big building, four floors. And it wasn't the easiest thing to do when you were pregnant and uh, having to stomp up several times a day as against where then we then moved to lose that were sort of tucked away behind Xerox uh, machines to what are now a full battery of toilets as they should exist on every floor. So that toilet index tells you how well uh, the organization wants to treat its women. So uh, of course, it's not the only index, but I think we have come a long way in our country. Are we where we should be? No. And we will not be unless society changes because women in the workplace, women empowerment is a given. It's a given. It's there. I mean, every three wheeler has messaging around uh, Beti Bachao, Beti Parao, around issues that are helpful for women. It is part of national agendas. But at the end of the day, until we deal with society, with the way men look and treat women, the way a husband behaves in terms of his working wife, the way the mother-in-law and the family supports her so that when she goes to work, they're there to help with the children, with the food, with the kitchen, with all those responsibilities. And I'm the first person to say that in, through my entire career, I always had a sense of guilt. And it was self-guilt there was nobody there telling me I should be guilty because the society's expectations of me were such that I was being brought up to believe that there were responsibilities that only I could fulfill. And if I wasn't there to do that, then there was that sense of failure. And that has to change. That women, we are often our own glass ceilings. We often see things and issues and problems that exist as if they exist when they don't. And unless we have the courage and the support of society around us, we will never rise to our full potential. We will be creating our own breaks. But today, I do believe we have a lot of empowered young girls there, ambition, parents who are dreaming for them, educating them, are uh, helping them take those strides forward. However, I think the expectations on the other side, 
that you have to be the good wife, good mother, and define all that also changes so that the expectations aren't that you're having to power on all cylinders all the time. Uh, it's unrealistic. And that one of there was a publication that did a study of uh, how men feel about uh, their working wives. It was all in that 30 to 40 page group. And the study showed that it was pretty high, 85% of the men were happy to have their wives work. And uh, it was to do with the economic agenda. It was, you know, maybe even pride in what they do. However, the same percentage were very clear that the role of the, uh, their wife was as a mother and as a wife. So that's what needs to change. You champion social and ecological causes and you're a philanthropist in addition to your corporate career. How do you shuffle so many roles, number one? And number two, what are you most passionate about at this stage of your career? So I retired from the bank, uh, what is now a while ago, 2015, uh, so end of 2015. And it's given me, I think these last seven years have been so rich because I've been able to do all that I love about the corporate side and not do what I didn't like about the corporate side. So the beauty of this is that you can pick and choose uh, what you want to do and stick with that. And I committed 40 to 50% of my time, it's more like 40 now, I'm sad to say, on not-for-profit work, primarily in the areas of water, sanitation, environment, and uh, empowerment of women as a whole separate agenda, which actually cross, is cross-cutting. I mean, water impacts women, sanitation impacts women. So everything you do can be with a gender lens, irrespective. So I found my sort of journey in water and sanitation while at uh, the bank where the bank was very early in its uh, time, much before many were looking at it, embraced climate change as an agenda. So very future thinking, very visionary top leadership. And uh, I was fortunate, I put my hand up for it, to get drawn into the global team, which was a small team, but had people like Nick Stern and you know some of the big uh, names in climate engaging in the thinking and the advice that was going into this program. So I was with the top team of the bank at the World Economic Forum and places such as this. So amazing ability to learn, but also to despair because I, we were on an important subject like water. And in the first such event, there was a handful of us, seven, eight of us in the room. Some really interesting people like Matt Diamond and uh, you know Montek Aluwalia, who was again a great uh, advocate of these things. But uh, just seven, eight of us in a global forum uh, on water. And five years later, there was the room would be packed to capacity with standing room only. So you, change happens very quickly. But to have been part of that change and understand the issues and bring them back to India to implement was. I was just so fortunate to be able to learn and understand these and in the process to understand that sanitation was where India was having to hang its head in shame. I would sit there in rooms with a lot of foreigners talking about India in uh, and rightly in terms which were like, hey, you know, open defecation, unless India solves it, those statistics are just going to look awful for the world, etc. To having then founded the India Sanitation Coalition which uh, my husband and I started six months before we were fortunate enough to have no other than Prime Minister Modi announce the program from the ramparts of the Red Fort, which then emerged into the Swachh Bharat mission, which dare I say is one of the most successful programs, not only of this government, but in terms of behavior change anywhere in the world. And India went from 40% under 40% access to toilets to 100% access to toilets. Now, we may not be open defecation free because not everybody's using the toilets and we have to continue to work at repairing toilets, replacing toilets, upgrading toilets, etc. But in a short period of time to even provide access at that level was a huge achievement. We have a lot to do yet. We have to make sure you know, the behavior change aspects remain, that people do use them, uh, that 
even more important, we should be able to treat what goes in there because it'll be a real tragedy if we funnel all the shit into these pots only to stick it back into the fields and our water bodies, which is exactly what we were trying to keep it away from. So the treatment side needs a lot of attention and the urban environment needs a lot of attention. The good news is that sanitation is very much part of the discourse. And uh, I was delighted actually sitting through the, the film Barbie. I don't know if you've seen it, but yes. I went sort of saying, I'm sure I'm not going to like this. I never played with Barbie dolls, <laughs> etc. But anyway, I went kicking and screaming and a little curious. And weird Barbie puts her hand up when she's asked which ministry she wants in this new non-patriarchal cabinet. Yeah, and she yeah. said, sanitation. So, yeah. So we're obviously working in the right space. In uh, changing tracks a bit, uh, because we have access to you and, you know, a lot of people will be listening to this uh, podcast. What would your advice be to startups and small companies in India that aspire to grow into these big juggernauts? How conducive is the Indian startup system to meeting these aspirations? So I have to start by saying that uh, advice is something which one has to be very carefully because uh, it's not for everyone to hang their sort of future and ambitions in. So mind can only be a view and it's not applicable to all. The startup system in India has been a very exciting one. There's no doubt. Uh, there was a lot of celebration on the unicorns we created and the speed at which uh, we have set this up. And dare I say we have the right ecosystem, particularly for startups in the tech uh, e-commerce uh, sort of platforms that have come up. Uh, all getting marvelous valuations and good funding, fortunately. We are falling short on governance and compliance because some of our best have fallen apart because they've got caught napping. These may not necessarily be frauds uh, that were committed willfully, but they have been, as a result of poor management, uh, defaults on loans, defaults on banks, poor accounting practice, uh, et cetera, et cetera and uh, pursuit of growth rather than ensuring a more orderly process, not enough uh, bottom line uh, focus in terms of profit. And there's only that far that you can go, just creating growth without uh, uh, producing that profit. So many learnings along the way. And I don't think these are uh, wrong. The world of startups has to be about self-correction and learnings along the way. And I think we in the startup world, in the innovation that India has uh, and will continue to do, have to just be mindful of this. And for those that sit on the boards and guide them, the private equity that invests in them, uh, we are the ones who have to keep an eagle eye out for these young entrepreneurs who are thinking, who are you know, growing, who are aggressive, attracting talent, to make sure that the guardrails are correctly set. So they don't go astray. I and mean, same as you would do with children, right? You don't want to hold them back. You don't want to smack them down just when they are thinking and living and wanting to move ahead. But there have to be guardrails in which they operate. And uh, I think we have to watch for that because otherwise we get into a syndrome where they can't raise money from the capital markets. Um, the IPOs that happened, uh, which are all trading below the IPO price. So then the next guys who go to raise money, no one wants to give them money because, hey, uh, they burnt their fingers the last time. So and so on, you know, banks being nervous about lending because they're not sure about the corporate governance practices. So the old principles of management, which can look very irritating and boring to a startup, are so critical to ensure that we almost need the old gray hairs there doing that. And you're seeing some of the companies now announcing this, you know, a retired head of HR at Infosys will come in and join yeah. by Cruise, and a retired CFO somewhere will come in to support a company that is needing this attention. So you get the experienced hands, those that will maybe even hold the company back, provide the guidance to make sure that the ideation doesn't get ahead of itself in terms of basic right practice. And I think that balancing will be a key part of as we go ahead. I should also say the world of finance. We are fortunate that Silicon Valley stepped forward and we now have some local uh, equity financing that is available. 
debt financing is still an issue and the startup world is no surprise is all very low capital type of startups what but what we really need we need startups in sanitation in water in areas which may require more capital expenditure and that is not going to be easy to come by so we need to change and amend and work in a way that enables uh, the financing of uh, startups in all fields particularly in the delivery of public goods in every public good that we have in this country which is short uh, which is delivery and of you know health delivery of education delivery of water sanitation these are systems and processes that we need new ways to do what has not worked for us uh, you've had a ringside view just changing gears a little bit of the evolution of banking in india over several decades do a little crystal ball gazing how do you see this evolution progressing over the next couple of decades which way do you see banking going what are the steps you see in its evolution over the next few coming decades the world of banking and i have to tell you i put together a book in 2006 2007 called contemporary banking in india and uh, rereading it uh, a matter of uh, you know a couple of years ago i was so struck by all that was said there and there were many voices in that book uh, how it was still applicable today which tells me the pace of change at which we have we, we all see the problems staring us in the face those same problems exist we all know the direction we want to go but that has still not been fulfilled so i think the journey we all understand and the journey as i see it is we need bigger banks we need more banks because if we want to grow as we should at 8 to 9% and at a minimum we're seeing 6 and a half 7 we need a robust banking system which is able to provide the finance we also need a robust corporate bond market so that we don't only rely on banks for finance but the fact is that we are short as we on all of that as we go forward the good news is that the banks that went through a pretty rough time and there were a lot of non performing loans uh, sitting in our banks books that's more or less cleaned up a uh, little help from government a little help from products that enable bank balance sheets to be cleared up that we have i think a banking system which is back on track and strong and not looking at risk of collapsing at all so good starting point but we need more growth more deposits in there more ability to lend more ability to flip those loans into the bond market so we can keep lending more and more to others and supporting the msme sectors not just chasing the big safe loans of the larger corporates but being able to support that huge big underbelly of india which is really where employment happens where 60% of uh, industry resides and that support is not that easy if we discuss this with the msme or the sme their access to finance is still a bit of a struggle their access to equity and debt is a struggle so my vision would be uh, that we have a robust capital market uh, which is the bond market and equity market is in any case looking pretty good and on the other side the banking system which is bigger larger more robust and able to support the growth we so desperately need what would your advice be to those who struggle to balance work and home work life balance what younger people call these days how did you do it and what is your advice to people uh, in today's day and age i think uh, the only way one can do this is with support from the family and support from people around us uh, so i always mention to women when i talk to them in forums that the, it's a career decision in terms of the husband you choose your spouse first and foremost has to be someone who knows you and loves you for who you are and supports that work and i was very fortunate uh, that i had an with a late marriage therefore someone who all who knew what i was knew what he was getting into and was the most amazing father husband and uh, support therein so it's i think that's one big part of it as women go 
uh, and frankly, it should be the same now for guys because uh, there are women that are at work as well. So for how they balance their careers is also a big learning. How does a current generation of empowered women and a current generation of men married to empowered women handle themselves, I think is also going to be a learning. I think the family, the mother-in-law, which is you know an institution which is uh, often so roundly criticized. Interestingly, in a book I put together, 30 women CEOs, their voices, their stories, uniformly, the mother-in-law was a support system. She was often living in the same home because uh, you know she was widowed or unwell and therefore moved in with the son. And these women, and I mean, these were the Zia Modis of the world and others of that ilk, swearing by the fact that they were able to waltz off to work because they had a mother-in-law who was keeping an eye on the kids. So and I know I benefited from it too. I could never bully my mother to come down and spend more than a couple of weeks at a time. But my mother-in-law, she would come spend three and four months with us when I was in Mumbai. And I know how much comfort I got from that. So that institution is one that I would always mention to all our women is please befriend and engage and take your mother-in-law in on your journey because she is going to be one of your biggest support groups. Uh, of course, the mother, sisters, you name it. And this book was very interesting. In fact, I know Arundhati has been interviewed by you on this series. And Arundhati talks about how she had her neighbors looking after her kid when she went off to work because you have a working husband, he's traveling. So you elicit whatever support you can get. One of the women in the book had her Stanford professor babysit her, her kids. So you just make friends wherever you can to make sure that you build that support system. And I think in India, we are still as women so much luckier than the Western world because we still live in a family which is not totally, you know, in, uh, well, first of all, there's a family and then there's a family that is willing to step in to support. And the other is that domestic help is still affordable and easy to find. It's not available uh, for everyone. It's not always reliable, but at least it's there. And it can ease, for example, the work one does in cleaning and cooking and some of that part of it sparing up more quality time with the kids. And I think we as Indian women should use every one of these advantages to ensure that we get to work and stay at work uh, right through our lives. Okay. Last question, Nena. Uh, it's a rapid fire round. I'll just throw a word or phrase at you and you react in a word or a few words or a phrase. And so let's go. Let's do this. If you had to craft next year's budget, what would you do? The budget for the country? Yeah, for the country. Yeah. Or I would uh, work on everything to do with women, uh, gender and empowerment. So push microfinance, uh, push for uh, more funding at the grassroots through livelihood and uh, on the gender front. Okay. India's GDP, the world's fifth highest, but what about other indicators like the Human Development Index? I think on the Human Development Index, uh, we have a ways to go. Uh, I would certainly like us to be improving uh, our agenda around uh, water and sanitation and health. And these are all integrated and ones which are very important for us to achieve. Artificial intelligence. So AI for AI's sake, I have a real issue. AI application, particularly in terms of public administration, could be huge. So it shouldn't be about corporates making money. It should be governments being able to govern better. Generation Z, Generation Z? I love them for their energy. I love them for their love of the environment. I just want them to be less selfish. Give of themselves. India's economy, uh, 2030? 2030, we must be a developed country. We have an, an economy which will be amongst the three, maybe five largest in the world. And for us, 
that must mean progress at all levels. So far less uh, uh, disparate income streams, closing of that gap. And I would like to believe world-class infrastructure, which by the way, we're well on the track on our airports, roads are now finally, finally uh, the envy of a lot, a lot of the developed world. And I, the sense of pride I have when I land at any one of our airports and then rub my hands in glee when I'm in uh, the UK or the US to see, relatively speaking, how advanced we are today is uh, really something which uh, we can achieve, clearly achieve uh, in every field if we put our minds to it. Who inspires you? What inspires you? Uh, my inspiration comes from every day that I meet someone who has managed to move ahead. It's uh, that woman who has been a domestic servant and whose kids are now uh, uh, studying technology at an IIT. It's uh, these stories. Uh, India has such a rich uh, tradition of uh, those that have managed to claw themselves out of the hole they were born in. And, and the good news right now is uh, kids from all backgrounds are making it through the system. And we can only laud that, celebrate that, and help them. So my inspiration is from many, many people every day that I encounter. This brings us to the end of our rapid fire round and pretty much to the close of our time on this podcast. But before we close, I asked Deepti Sethi, the CEO of PRCAI, to ask you her burning communication question of the day. Thank you, Nirith and Ms. Kidwai. What an interview. Great inspiration. I think you're an inspiration for so many women. And I so look forward to this. I have one question. Uh, how do you think that finance and banking sector in India has transitioned uh, with its role of communication and storytelling being part of it for public image or reputation management? So how do you see communication playing a role in the banking and finance sector? You know, I've seen communication through behavior change work in sanitation and at the grassroots. And we would have been nowhere if we had built toilets and then not persuaded people to use them. I think in the banking environment, uh, uh, we can do better because we need to be able to communicate that this is not a palace for the literate, but that anyone can walk in and there's someone there to help you to access what you need to access. I do find that in just a recent discussion I was having with Seva, their women, where there's a loan program that is available, are hesitant to go to access the loans they can readily get because the, the environment of the bank they have to walk into, even though there may be people deputed there to help them, is overwhelming. And if we have to be able to communicate and have systems and processes which are not threatening, that someone should not go in feeling a fool but to walk in knowing it's their right. And I think as a communication exercise, banks can do much better at that. Uh, we can also communicate investment products. Uh, and there's a certain amount that's happening through media, fortunately, there on the money, how to manage money. Uh, we need a lot more to help women manage their own money, that they don't leave this to the guys in the family. There's no reason that should be. It's their money. They should be part of the family's decision and therefore encourage that through the investment decisions that get made. So I think banks have to stop just projecting their brand and try and look pretty and actually get down to some serious work in terms of bringing citizens along the path of truly being banked and not underbanked. Thank you. That's a great point of view. Back to you, Nirit. Thank you so much, Mrs. Kidwai. Thank you. Nena, it was wonderful chatting to you. And I'm sure you're going to give our listeners plenty to think about and to ruminate on and strategies to deal with everyday situations. And this brings us to the end of this episode of Unmute. Till next time, this is Nirat Alva saying goodbye.